I'm here at the London Stock Exchange and I'm joined now by the music legend Niall Rogers and Merc Mercuriatus, of course, the manager extraordinaire who's come up with the company that is being listed today. Congratulations on the listings. And of course, what are you hoping, what's on your radar that you're going to buy, Merc? Uh, we have over 400 million pounds worth of pipeline from some of the greatest songwriters in the world. And we will be concluding these deals uh, very, very quickly, as you'll see today. Well, as you say, you've raised, I mean, to date, you, uh, we had the figures actually at 200 million pounds. That's that, what we've raised. Exactly, that what you've raised so far. But now, obviously, you're on the advisory board for Hypnosis Songs, as well as being a music legend. What will you be advising Merck to, to buy? Um. <laughs> <laughs> All my music, of course. No. <laughs> um, look, I, I um, for a long time, I've always wondered why the most important part of electronic entertainment IP is the least valued. I've been in many a meeting where I've done a film, and I won't mention any name, but like the CEO is talking about how much money I'm getting paid, and I say, play that scene without my music. Let's just try that again. <laughs> <laughs> to, to prove my point, I said, now look at the difference with my music and without. Um, do you really want to underpay me? Um, so what we're really trying to do is to get people to recognize the value of the song because as its own, um, you know, I, every song has its own P&L statement, right? Every single song. And people don't seem to realize that, that each song is its own independent business. And we want people to understand how valuable that music is. We want people to recognize that the song is the most important component in music. It permeates its way through our culture and lasts for generations. And in the same way that you think of gold and diamonds and oil as precious things, we hope that once we fulfill our ambition here that people will think of songs at the same time as they're thinking of gold and oil and diamonds. <laughs> or pork bellies. <laughs> <laughs> or pork bellies. But Merck, of course, you've managed some of the biggest acts in the business, Beyonce, Guns N' Roses, and of course, Niall here uh, himself. But what makes you feel that they'll want to give you that control? Well, you know, the, the, we tend to work with songwriters, and songwriters spend uh, huge chunks of their career in anonymity, giving people, as I said before, the, the most important component. And there are two things that are at play here. One is that if you're a songwriter, even if you're making two, three million dollars a year, and you're at that place in your life where you're ready to get a check for 30 million dollars because that will make a significant difference in your life, this type of transaction is the only type of transaction that gets you there because you can't go and play live, you can't sell merchandise, you can't uh, uh, do these other things that artists can do because artists are the, the public side of it. Um, the other thing is is that you know we've now reached this place in the maturation of the music that we've all grown up with where our greatest creators are dying of natural causes. So for many, estate planning is not an issue in terms of what do you you know what are you leaving to your children in terms of wealth. But most songwriters tend to view their children as songs as well. So we are safe custodians for those songs going forward um, in terms of ensuring that they maintain their value, that the writer's legacy, that the artist's legacy is maintained as well. Now, of course, you did try at the IPO last year. Why did you feel now is the right time to try again? Well, I, you know, I know that you know, there are words that the city uses like new asset class, mm -hmm. right? And this is obviously a new asset class. It took a year to educate people and to get people to recognize that, in fact, songs are as important. They're predictable, they're reliable, the income streams that they put off when you're putting proven, when you're buying proven hit songs, are you know, 50, 60 years like that. Um, and we're now at this inflection point, and I think this is very important for the city, where after 15 years of technological disruption, where it was possible for people to be able to consume music for free, we've now reached this inflection point where through streaming, that technology has come full circle, and it's more convenient for people to pay for music, and the income is starting to skyrocket as a result. 
Now, raising the 200 million pounds, uh, do you think you'll start spending, what, about 70 million of it? Correct, today. <laughs> we will start as early as today. We intend to deploy 150 million pounds within six months, the full 200 million pounds within nine months, have paid out our maiden dividends, and then come back and ask our friends in the city for more. <laughs> Mark, why come to the city? Why not go to private investors? critical mass we our ambition ultimately is to change the songwriters position in the economic equation at the moment the songwriter is on one thirteenth of the economic model we do not think that that reflects the fact that they are providing the most important component in the success of music today the song itself the only way that we can change that is you know, at 200 million pounds, we will be about 4% of the worldwide publishing market day one. At a billion pounds, which is where we'd like to be three years from now, we'll be 18 or 19% of the worldwide publishing market. And at that point, we will have the critical mass that's necessary to be able to affect the change. That will be great for our shareholders because obviously we'll get paid more money for the assets that we have. Mm -hmm. But we are also doing something that, is, that are going to benefit songwriters all over the world. And one of the most important things is that exponential growth is actually built into what we do. I've never ever seen a song become worth less, <laughs> ever. Um, and the thing is, not is a that hit song. <laughs> not, no, not, absolutely not. And even things, I mean, come on, look at my own career. I've had songs that were flops when they were released, but then someone else comes along and it re they reinterpret it. Next thing you know, you get a song like Lady, Hear Me Tonight which was from a film that closed in less than a week and we got a number one record. Now, this, now that copyright is worth millions. And that's the active management that we will bring to these songs that we acquire to take them to new heights of success. But what sort of catalogs do you think? I mean, it was rumored last year the names of sort of Justin Bieber were put out. Who are you looking at? I think when you see our announcements in the <laughs> next 24 hours, um, <laughs> that you'll be quite pleased. <laughs> Anyone you can hint at? <laughs> Possibly, <laughs> some of those names that you've talked about. <laughs> ah, okay, newly engaged Justin Bieber. Uh, now let's talk about your own career. It's been incredible. You've had such longevity in this business and huge hits, both your own and of course working with such legends as David Bowie, also you've worked with Madonna as well. What's been the secret, do you think, to your success? I absolutely love what I do. I wake up every morning with some sort of motif, some sort of idea that, um, not always good ones, but in fact they are musical and they have a life and they sometimes grow up into real hit records. Um, I love doing it and I dread the day that I wake up and there's no idea. And Niall, it, what's it like for you to be here at the London Stock Exchange? I know from your early history, you've been homeless. Uh, you overcame a lot of challenges in your childhood. And here you are at the London Stock Exchange. Um, this is pretty exciting. Um, we've been working towards this day for some time now. And we had many ideas as to how, we'll go about, how to go about um, doing this. Um, we thought about posting earlier and doing other things, but now we're really pleased we feel like we're on solid footing and that this is the right way to go and how does it feel for you personally just having the journey that you've come through and here you are you're asking me <laughs> am i having fun <laughs> yeah. which is what the real question is <laughs> yeah. forget the business part i'm having a blast this, you you people have been lovely um it, it, I mean, it feels like home. You've now said to me, I'm part of the club. I'll always be welcome. I love it. And now talking about a fellow American, of course, we do have President Trump coming to the UK at the end of the week. You've met him. You've known him a long time. What, what do you make of his unconventional style? <laughs> I think that should be in another interview, frankly. <laughs> <laughs> Let's keep this super positive. <laughs> How do you think the UK will welcome him, though? I have no idea. I'm actually uh, 
waiting to see what happens as we were going. You know, I'm the new chief creative uh, advisor to Abbey Road. And as I was going to work yesterday, the, um, the Secret Service motorcade passed us. And yeah. it was really long. And I was like going. That'd be 40 vehicles. Oh, at least 40. And, and those were the, just the American ones. And then the, the UK police and the bomb squads and all that stuff followed. And I thought to myself, hmm. I can't wait to see how this turns out because um, I, I, I just, I don't, I don't know. This is um, a very interesting moment in time for me. Uh, I've always believed that uh, by now, certainly by the year 2018, we'd be in a different place. Um, let's just use the word spiritually, um, which is, I think, the kindest word I could use. Um, but l let's see, I mean, I'm an optimistic person by nature, so yeah. let's hope that this all sort of works one out. One of the things that I keep hearing from our friends in the city is that what they like about our fund is that it's uncorrelated. Yes. <laughs> and, yes. you know, the truth of it is, is that songs are the fabric of society. And, yes. you know, Niall and I are both big Al Green fans. Mm -hmm. And he once famously wrote the words, whether times are good or bad, happy or sad. And I think that that's probably as much as we should say about Donald exactly. Trump. Exactly. <laughs> well, just before we just before we go off the subject of Donald Trump, now, uh, you know, as a fellow American, how do you feel about being represented by him? Because he is going to be here meeting the Queen. Um, how do you feel? I mean, a recent poll has said that half, you know, over half of Americans thinks that he's racist. How does that make you feel? Um, I, uh, I've, you know, it's, it's quite uncomfortable for me in a strange way because I'm a New Yorker. I was born in New York. I've lived there all my life. Um, and I've seen um, what I can only refer to as antics uh, by him. And, and it's, it seems like it's behavior unbecoming of a person of that stature. I mean, you, you, you know, you're the president of the United States. And prior to him becoming the president of the United States, um, I just think that there's a way that you handle yourself in business. There's a way that you handle yourself with people. Um, I like to believe in kindness. I just think that that's a very good way to do business. I've been doing this a very long time, over 40 years. Um, there's no artist that I've worked with that I couldn't work with tomorrow. I, I don't have any enemies, um, at least I don't think so. <laughs> I mean, sometimes they seem like enemies when you don't get a hit record, but that sort of blows over rather quickly uh, because my philosophy is that I always try and have my artist's best interest at heart, and I believe they know that. My history is already written. If I never have another hit record again, I mean, I've got a pretty... Someone said the other day, they were looking at my neighboring rights licensing agreements, and they said, Jesus Christ, now, we're already at 1,500 recordings. You've made more than 1,500 recordings. I said, well, when did you start calculating? They said, well, when you signed Sheik. I said, I made records before I was with Sheik. <laughs> <laughs> well, now, talking of which, you're going to be performing three songs later today, and you're on your European tour. How does it feel to be back? Um, it's wonderful. I, I play every day of my life, uh, well, most days of my life. Um, I love making music. I love playing guitar. I love getting other people involved. That's the most fun. People ask me, um, you know, why do you still do this? You could have stopped a long time ago. I said, guys, I could have stopped after I wrote I'm Coming Out, and, you know, Diana Ross's album. I could have stopped after We Are Family, but I actually like it. It's not because of the financial gain. Um, I said, you know, I'd almost do this for free Almost. <laughs> there's, there's something very special about Nile and Sheik in the sense that, you know, every great artist has an ethos and they're going to leave you feeling something. What separates Nile and Sheik from the rest of the world is that if you come to a Nile and Sheik show, you're going to leave happier than when you arrived. <laughs> and in a strange sort of calorie burning sort of way, that feeling will stay with you for many, many days afterwards. <laughs> Well, I'm saying thank you to the Merkin Nile show for today. <laughs> Congratulations on today's listings, guys. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you.